Thanks to thank you for, Lord. So that's why we give you all the glory and praise for everything. I ask that you would lead, guide, and direct us as we uh, have this meeting. Protect us as we travel home. Protect You're us unmuted. in our communities. And uh, protect the Cherokee Nation and, and everybody around the world. And uh, Lord, we just love you. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Very good. Uh, roll call. <coughs> Shelly? Yes, ma'am. Janice Taylor? Here. Joe Deere? Keith Austin? Here. Charlie Buzzard? Joe Bird? Honey? Julia Cook? Here. Sean Crittenden? Honey? Mike Dobbin? Here. Hayden Duncan? Honey? Rach Jordan? Here. Daryl Legg? Here. Wes Nightfire? Amen. Dora Petskowski? Here. Mike Shambaugh? Terry Bakersdahl? Ani? E.S. Smith? Victoria Vesquez? Ani? We have a form. Okay. Um, I would entertain a motion to approve the October 29 minutes. Second. Got a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposition? Okay. So we heard from Chuck Garrett last night in the um, council meeting, and since it was just the next day, I have asked Stephen Bilby, the um, head of our diversified businesses, to go ahead and give us his update for 2020. I understand there was a record year of contact wins. So Chuck, I'll send it to you. Do you have anything to add since last night? No, uh, I really don't. I just uh, remind uh, the council that uh, we have provided our uh, monthly report. It should be uh, in your uh, in your materials there for review. And happy to answer any questions, of course. Janice, uh, Kanan has a question for Chuck. Okay, Chuck Kanan Duncan has a question. Hey, Chuck. Um, so I know I've, I've sent an email about this, and um, I'm get, I've been getting some more um, calls on it, um, and I hope you guys can take a look at it. So, like, like with our businesses, and and CNI is is kind of what I'm talking about, but all of our businesses um, in our community, our schools are are going virtual because of the community spread, and so um, several schools are going virtual all the way up into December. And so, um, you know, obviously our, those parents who are working at CNI, they would have made arrangements during Thanksgiving break or Christmas break uh, probably, but uh, this, this has kind of come at a, a different time. And, and so uh, I'd really like you guys to take a good hard look at, at some type of policy maybe or, or approach to uh, dealing with that rather than Take your PTO till it's gone, and then get points, and you know until you're pointed out, um, because that's ultimately what I, I would like to see avoided. Um, so if you guys could could just take a, a look at that, I'd, I'd sure appreciate it. Uh, you, you bet, Councilor. Thank you for the question, or thank you for the comment. Uh, we have been, in fact, coordinating uh, some with the various uh, administration uh, officials, officers there at the nation as well as some other departments to, to try to come up with some comprehensive and but consistent uh, policy to address this. Of course, it's affecting all of us in, uh, in different ways, but uh, the healthcare workers, uh, uh, other essential workers, as well as, you know, our folks at CNI and our gaming uh, businesses as well. So, um, it's it's not being um, you know the lack of effort or lack of concern that we haven't announced a broader policy, but we are trying to stay consistent so that um, we don't have uh, folks that, that feel disenfranchised or otherwise uh, you know, un, un, uh, considered. So, um, but thanks for the question. We, we're we're on the case. Thank you, sir. Hey, does anybody else have anything for um, Chuck? <coughs> hey, I'm going to throw it over to you, Mr. Bilby. Well, uh, thanks again for, for asking us to come, Madam Chair. It's always a, a privilege to, to get to uh, represent um, our employees in, inside of diversified businesses. Uh, we did have a, a successful year, and I'll, I'll, I'll tell you more about that. Um, 
First off, if I, if I could, uh, around this time of year, every year we we have our leadership summit, and this year that's going to be a, a virtual summit, uh, of course, due to the circumstances. Uh, but we always kick that summit off with a launch video that that. Uh, we create uh, with our internal marketing team. So I would like to, to play that video for you and then we'll get into the, the details of the presentation. <clears throat> Fifth track or something? I think Kanan's supposed to be singing. Hey, <laughs> Stephen, uh, it, the video is playing, but the audio is not. It started out the first three seconds, but it stopped. So I just want to make you aware that they're, they're not able to hear what's going on there. We, we've been having some issues with WebEx today. Yeah, I was I was a little I was a little worried about that and knew it would be a bit of a gamble to, to try to play that video. Um, what what we'll do for you guys is is make sure that that we get you uh, a, a place where you can link to and, and watch this this video. So it's a it's a great video. It, it's it's got a good storyline to it and really connects. Uh, our employees with the ultimate purpose of, of why we are here uh, to enable Cherokee citizens and and, and it makes that connection and, and we're, we're very proud of it. Um, it also gives, gives you some indication of our success and where our focus is from a customer perspective. So I apologize. I knew it was a risk for, for that to to work over WebEx, uh, but I thought it was worth that risk. So I'll, I'll quickly just move straight into the presentation. Can you all see that? We can. Yes. <coughs> so I'll, I'll start with going back in, in history a little bit, right? Diversified Businesses was created so that in 2020, right, in, in timing with the compact, that we would have a revenue stream um, that that equaled what our uh, gaming revenue uh, would be, and, and at the time we didn't know exactly where that gaming revenue would would ultimately end up in 2020. Uh, but we knew that that we needed that vision, and 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 I'm happy to tell you that much of that has been executed today. This was the goal that we set for the organization to exceed 700 million in revenue at an 8% EBITDA margin. This slide shows you that we were slightly short of that 700 million goal. We achieved 613 million. I will tell you when we set that goal, um, we had multiple acquisitions planned. Um, those didn't come to fruition, but we continued to grow the organization significantly without those. And so while we were short on the revenue side, um, you see there in green, we exceeded the EBITDA or profit goal uh, by over $12 million. So we had an 8% goal uh, on $700 million being $56 million. We achieved $68 million in, in 2020. So very proud of the, the team. They were able to, to take, you know, less than that 700 would make the profit of, of that greater than the 8%. So we're, we're extremely proud of that. They did a great job. I'll give you just some facts about the business and, and um, quickly move through these. Since 2012, we've completed 5,300 contracts for the federal government. Today, and, and we're quickly growing in, in this time of year, we have 3,300 plus employees. We've done over six billion in contract wins since 2012. The numbers are, are starting to get staggering um, and, and, and exciting. We've served 60 different agencies in, inside of, of the federal government. And that, that proves the, the <coughs> diversity of our organization inside of, of diversified businesses. About 1,875 active contracts today. That number was right at 1,000 last year. And this shows you the growth though, over the, the last 10 years or, or so, going from 145 million to 
to, like I said, 613 million today. We continue that, that northeasterly trajectory, uh, which is where we want to be, and we expect that to continue in, into 2021. From an EBITDA perspective, I, I love this chart. I hope you do as well. Uh, it, it, goes, it goes straight up to the right. Um, we're, we're very proud of that um, and, and proud of the return that that ultimately gives the, the nation to provide the, the much needed services and functions. And this is our contract wins view. This is an indicator for us of future success and future growth. Um, so you can see there, uh, we had a record year from a contracts perspective as, as well. We won just over $1.1 billion in, in contracts for fiscal year 2020. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you, uh, we were uh, quite concerned when um, the pandemic hit and everyone went home, including many of the contracting officers inside the government. Um, Many contracts that were supposed to be let continued to be delayed, um, and they continued to push further and further to the right, to the point that going into September, we were significantly behind uh, what our contract wins goal was. In the month of September, we won almost 600 million in contracts. To give you some perspective on that, uh, our, our, our record for the month of September prior to 2020 was about $250 million. So we won more than double what we typically see. And so now the organization is working very hard to stand up all of those contracts uh, that we won in the last month and, and begin execution and, and operation on those. I think this is an important slide. We call it the chase. Uh, it's, it's our focus on where we stand uh, relative to our competition. And we rank ourselves against other, other tribes and Alaskan Native corporations. And as you can see, uh, we're, we're currently sitting in, in the third spot. Um, to be fully transparent, the, the, all the numbers except for ours are 2019 numbers. Ours is 2020. Uh, but we know that we're growing significantly faster than, than our competition. So in just over 10 years, um, we have placed ourselves uh, in the top three of tribes in A and C's. And of the lower 48 tribes, we are the top federal contractor. Very proud of that. And we continue to chase the uh, Alaskan Native corporations. They had about a 10-year head start on us. Uh, they've done significantly more acquisitions than we have done, um, but we, we continue to grow faster and continue to inch up closer and closer. Our goal is to be the number one federal contractor in the tribal A and G space. <coughs> so looking forward, right, 2020 has passed. I gave you perspective on how, how we um, achieved against that, that objective. Um, so now it's time to, to set a new goal, and, and Chuck is, has has pushed us to be a, aggressive and been very supportive of the things that, that we need to, to accomplish this. Uh, but our goal for 2025 is to, to see revenue at $1.5 billion. Uh, and that is, that is fairly significant growth, uh, a little more than double for the organization. However, we feel that it is achievable. And we have a, a couple different ways that we're focused on doing this. One is continue to grow organically, right? Continue to build the business that we have today uh, and the capabilities that we have today. And so we think by 2025, that existing line of business will be a, a billion dollars in, in revenue. And then there's organic growth, and this specifically means through acquisition, right? So over the next five years, we, we want to acquire the right companies with the right capabilities to set us up for a, a success that equals 500 million in, in, in that category. And then looking out into the future, into the year 2025, while we win a billion dollars uh, today, we want to set the organization up and position us where we're winning $2 billion in 2025. And continuing to build for the future, we know that as, as we continue to grow larger and larger, we have to create differentiated products and services, right? So whether that's in cloud transformation, cybersecurity, data analytics, those sorts of things, we're very focused on now that we have size and scale, creating those products and services that set us even further apart 
from the rest of, of the market. That that concludes my presentation. I'm, I'm happy to answer uh, any questions that, that you have. And again, apologize for the the technical issue on, on the video. Does anybody have any questions for Mr. Bilby? Go, J.D. Mr. Bilby, Joe Deere here, how are you? Good, how are you, sir? Good, hey, quick question. Have you seen or looked at the margins with going against the other contractors? Is it narrowed? Mm -hmm. Have those bids tightened up with COVID hitting? And secondly, on materials for certain projects, have you seen it affect any of the vendors? Uh, I, I would I would say that what what we're seeing um, in the market right now is is we're not necessarily seeing the bids tighten up due to COVID. Um, I I think in the in the near future or over the next 12 to 18 months, depending on what happens in the commercial market, everything outside of of government contracting, if we see the economy go into a recession over the next 12 to 18 months, typically what happens is you will see some contractors push into the federal space, and that's where you'll start to see those, those margins tighten up. Um, from a cost of goods perspective on, on materials, um, we are seeing lead time issues on some of the products just due to, to shipping issues and, and, and the like. Uh, we're seeing some costs slightly tick up, um, and being, you know, laser focused on making sure that we're, we're pricing those into uh, our contracts and, and making sure that we're, we're, you know, being aggressive from a pricing perspective to win, but also maintaining our profitability on those contracts. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, sir. I just want to express my appreciation, um, Stephen, because I know that when you're working on those tight profit margins, there is no margin for error. You have to be very careful. And so we appreciate what you guys are doing, staying on top of the market in general, and always looking for new opportunities because it's what allows us to help our citizens. So we appreciate you guys. No further questions. We're going to let you get back to work. Thank you all. I appreciate the support. Uh huh. Thanks for being here. And thank you, Chuck D. Thank you, guys. Appreciate you very much. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Trey was there. Are you still there, Trey? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Do you have anything to tell us? <clears throat> well, um, you guys have the reports in front of you um, this month uh, as it explains in the report. Uh, because this meeting was a little early, we haven't actually uh, had our first close for FY 2020 yet. That will take place on Friday. So uh, for the component units that did have uh, a close for September 30, 2020, we've included those in your packet. Um, other than what is in the report, um, you know, we're obviously still um, working hard to get the CRF programs, um, you know, stood up and get the money out to the citizens and, and get the help where it needs to be. Um, also, as we spoke about in the previous meeting, I have been working closely with AG Hill and um, uh, Judge Bartow and uh, Shan Buell, the marshals, for uh, figuring out how we're going to pay for the McGirt impacts. Um, I will say that we have um, we have pending budget mod requests of 18.5 million right now, and um, I don't believe we're going to be able to fund that full amount at this time, just out of gin funds. Um, what we're planning on doing is using the FY19 carryover. Um, we had more of that than expected uh, because when we were doing the, the budget process, we had anticipated that we weren't going to receive any more dividends from Cherokee Nation businesses due to COVID. Um, as it turns out, and you heard uh, one of the main reasons uh, just prior to me, it, they had an increase in their other business uh, units. So they actually were able to uh, get within $7 million of the budgeted dividends. Um, and 
they're going to do a, a special dividend to make us whole. Um, it was something they felt strongly they wanted to do. So uh, we actually are going to be made whole on our FY20 um, budget dividend from C and D. So that is giving us some breathing room, actually, and, and probably the only reason that we're able to fund as much of the request on the McGirt as, as possible right now. Um, you know, obviously still looking forward to long-term solutions because um, this isn't sustainable. Uh, I think, in my opinion, you know, we will aggressively um, chase federal dollars to fund the needs there uh, through through multiple departments, whether it be the DOJ or the DOI or, or any other available funding source. Um, but I do think that we are going to have to consider taxation um, and we're going to have to exercise our taxation jurisdiction within our reservation. Um, that is not something that can be done overnight by any means. Um, it takes a lot to set up a, uh, those systems and those functions. Uh, so we'll working through that, um, bounce some ideas off of anyone who will listen and, and trying just much like the sovereignty commission, trying to get some uh, suggestions put together and uh, we can move forward from there. Um, part of it will also probably be having to wait on some court decisions because I anticipate that um, there will be litigation over the taxation issues on the, on the reservation. So, um, but it's all on the plate there and uh, trying to get it as much accomplished as quickly as possible. So with that, I will pause and, and see if there are any questions. Got your leg. Actually, uh, so has any, if, we're, if we are thinking about starting to do any kind of taxation, um, is that gonna be sales tax? land tax what 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 kind of taxes are we talking about so I mean, at this point anything's on the table and of course um it would be up to this body really what they wanted to uh, what you you wanted to implement um but you know if we wanted to stay in line with the state of Oklahoma so that it is less confusing for the citizens then that would be something along the lines of um it could be income tax uh, the sales tax, property tax, we have all of that authority within the reservation. If we wanted to look at alternative um, systems, you know, there are, there are a lot of other uh, alternative taxing systems out there, uh, like New Mexico uh, does a gross receipts tax, um, Nevada does a business privilege tax. So there are, uh, there are numerous ways to do it, and, you know, it's, it's at our reservation, and we have the Autonomy to set that up as we as we want. So um, I think it will be just looking at the numbers, seeing what makes sense. Um, you know, I, one of the things, one of the challenges always with taxation is is um, compliance. So we want to make it as as easy as possible for citizens and businesses to comply. So that will be one of the main driving factors, I think. So would it be a tax on top of a tax? Like, will they still be paying the state and then an additional tax would be coming to us? Or would they no longer be paying the state or city? And then you know, I'm just trying to get my mind wrapped around. Yeah, yeah. So, um, well, I will, I will, I'll caveat this, you know, with my, my disclaimer up front that this is not tax advice. And everyone should just, <laughs> <laughs> they're only taking a tax attorney about their own situation, so. Uh, but in general, um, uh, if you are a Cherokee citizen and you live on the, reserva the Cherokee Reservation and you earn your income from the Cherokee Reservation, then you would um, not be subject to state income tax. And in fact, the, the Oklahoma Tax Commission has put out a report that, that states as much. Um, where it gets tricky is the non-native or non-Cherokee that are living in, you know, residing in, and operating businesses or earning their income on the reservation. And that, I think, is where we're gonna see the most litigation come from because um, it, it could very well be that it's a situation where there is double taxation. Um, because in, in many of those cases, the court has to apply what's called the Bracker test. 
So it's a, it's a balancing test. It's definitely not a bright line test. It's a balancing test that um, weighs the interests of the state versus the tribe and, um, to see really what taxes can be applicable. And it's very possible that, that both can be applicable. That's, you know, something that we probably will, I would say, my opinion only, I don't speak for anyone else, but um, I would say we would want to avoid that because that could stifle economic development. Um, that that double taxation issue is, a, is an issue that is um, you know, prevalent throughout Indian country. Um, you can look at Nevada and New Mexico in particular for those uh, type of issues. It, it becomes very costly to do business there because if, if you're not a Navajo, um, it, but you're operating on the Navajo reservation, you're going to owe taxes to both the Navajo tribe and um, the state of New Mexico or Arizona, depending on which part of the reservation you're in. But um, it, it gets complex pretty quickly. I'll say that. So for the Navajo, Rufus, do they pay federal, state, and Navajo taxes, or do they just do state and Navajo? So if it's a Navajo citizen living on the Navajo reservation, I believe they just pay federal and Navajo taxes. They would not pay state. But if you are not a Navajo, um, so reaching back to my to my previous uh, job, if, if the Cherokee Nation businesses or one of their subsidiaries was doing business on the Navajo Reservation. Um, we had several construction projects that we did uh, on the Navajo Reservation over time. And we owed um, both the Navajo, uh, basically it's a sales tax, but the Navajo sales tax, and we owed New Mexico. So it, we had a double taxation, but that wouldn't apply to tribal citizens living on their own reservation. Okay. My mind just going, we're just going, yeah. <clears throat> Joe, did you? I, I, no, mean, I don't know who's doing meeting. it. Everywhere, whoever's yeah. running it. Did you have a question? Yeah, trade, which leads me to uh, an interesting question. So, if you're doing algorithm tax and stuff like that, if the state or the Fed decide that we can do that, would it be a benefit going forward, like to buy a large area where they do get a lot of sales tax, put it land in trust, and then be able to collect that money if we go forward? Is that part of it if we get decisions based on that? Um, it's my understanding that, uh, you know, based on like the Chickasaw um, case that went to the U.S. Supreme Court back in the 90s, um, that, that our entire reservation now is considered Indian country. Um, they use the definition uh, that's in the Major Crimes Act, actually, with regard to the, the sales tax, and that includes reservations, land held in trust, and um, uh, independent Indian communities. So it, it kind of encompasses all of it. So that would, I don't think that we would need to buy land to put it into trust because uh, my understanding is that our entire reservation would be treated uh, basically as trust land. Okay. We'll, go, we'll leave it with that. <laughs> I'll talk to you later about some other ideas. Councilor <laughs> Shambo. I found it um, pretty promising, though, when um, Attorney General Barr was here and he asked, I believe it was uh, two U.S. attorneys said, well, he, when he said, uh, isn't this common sense that uh, the Cherokee Nation will now get to uh, receive tax money? And they just sat there. Remember, yeah. and they didn't say anything. And isn't that common sense to think that was going to happen? And he made them answer, and they actually agreed with him, but... They didn't want to answer it at first. Uh, did you notice that? I did. You know, I, I actually really appreciated A.G. Barr's comments. It, he brought up um, the the issue before I did, and, and that is the, the fact is that there's not an actual increase in the number of cases. The number of cases is the same. It's just we're switching jurisdictions now. So Oklahoma is losing the cases and the Jewish nation is, is gaining them, right? So, you know, there has been, fun, there's funding out there currently because we're paying, you know, someone's paying for it now. So what he had mentioned was, you know, talking with the state, getting an agreement with the state. So when those cases transfer over to us, that the fund, some funding does too, um, which is something that I had um, 
I, I would very much like to see. And something that I planned on bringing up to him while he was here, and uh, he beat me to punch. So he and I are on the same page with that. It's you know the the, the funding. You know, if you're thinking about it on a basic level, it's reasonable to think that funding should follow the cases. You know, if they if they move jurisdiction. So um, although I, I'm certainly certain that the state will find us on that one. Awesome. Thank you. <coughs> Councilor Buzzer. Uh, Harley, go ahead. Do, you, um, do we have any idea or any estimate of dollars of what the Cherokee Nation employees and Cherokee Nation business employees pay in state tax? Do we have any any ballpark? You know, I do. I do have that number. I looked it up for our economic um, impact study, but it's been quite a while ago since I looked at those numbers. Um, so I'd hate to try to tell you off the cuff and, and, and misstate myself, but I can I can pull that report back up and get back to you with those numbers. It would be interesting to see what those numbers are. And then as it goes now, you know, the Cherokee Nation doesn't charge a tax at all on our payroll. So, you know, there's some possibilities there to, to look at that. And even uh, the contractors that come into our district, they don't pay us any taxes whatsoever that I know of. So. You know, there's some ways to get to raise some of those funds up to get some tax money. So, anyway, it'd be curious to see what those numbers are yeah. say. <clears throat> I, yeah, I will. Um, and, and that's something that we had talked about previously because, um, you know, we will have to follow the law and, and whatever the law is, um, we will have to adhere to it. But it may be that that we have to adjust the way we're withholding and remitting taxes from our, our payroll. And that's something that is on our, our radar. Um, it, one of the other things that um, you kind of, something you mentioned there reminded me of was also that um, traffic tickets uh, and the fines that come along with those traffic tickets would be uh, another potential source of revenue um, to pay for some of these, you know, whether that is, is funneled directly to a traffic court, I think A.G. Hill had kind of mentioned that in the last meeting that, um, you know, while the big daunting task are these, you know, criminal cases where there's violent offenders, um, that doesn't want us off the hook for the smaller stuff too, including including a traffic court. And that's going to cost money to operate as well. So um, there's there are a lot of agreements that need to be reached, I think, I think the only path forward to, to be truly successful as, as, as a whole is for the tribes and the states to work together. So hopefully, um, you know, we can start moving the ball on that. Obviously, that's not in my realm wheelhouse to do that um, above my pay grade, but I, I, I don't see any way around it, to be quite honest. Madam Chair. <clears throat> Trey, uh, have we done any... Uh projections on what our sales tax or even our land tax might be by certain districts? You know, I, I attended that. What's really hard is um, that the Oklahoma Tax Commission has all of that information and it's not publicly available. So it, it's kind of like, uh, you know, I, I can't make those estimates if I don't know how much money someone in a certain um, county is making. So uh, it's, I could get some really rough numbers, but um, with the confidentiality around that kind of stuff, it, it's hard to make an accurate prediction. And, and, you know, we will have to have someone other than just your office uh, gathering up this information because this is a lot of information to, to store and project in the future as we move forward with these cases. And you know, you guys mentioned yeah. earlier our United States Attorney General being here, and that was really a good visit in the comments that he made pertaining to our sovereignty and what we as a tribe are capable of doing. The flip side of that is this new president will reappoint that Attorney General and the two U.S. attorneys in Oklahoma, <coughs> in our area. That's the flip side. So. We are going to have to uh, get back in and learn how to network with our new elected officials. So thank you, Madam Chair.
That's a shame. Bob, did you have something Just to add? Just very quickly, uh, I can tell you this, that there's um, several agencies, municipalities who are already, if they are writing tickets to Native Americans, they are putting them under tribal. My office is already doing that and we're just passing them because we know it's coming and there's no reason to uh, waste your time, I mean, so to speak, by having it in our court and them saying, hey, we don't want to be here and we know that we have, they'll have to go to tribal. So we are actually, uh, <coughs> our tickets go tribal and they're getting put in a, a, basically a pile and when the time comes and the Cherokee Nation is ready, then those tickets, you know, whatever agreement's made up, and West Side own the same thing, and West Side writes a lot of tickets. Um, we will be getting a bit of income from tickets all over the, uh, our jurisdiction because there's agencies that are already preparing to do that. And I know that they will want uh, probably a percentage of it, but, you know, it okay. won't be a lot, but it, but it would really be good if, if they're doing the work that they should get a percentage of that, but uh, that, that is going to give us some income. And one other thing real quick, another thing that, that's going to be affected, and I know this has nothing to do with anything, but just something that we should think about is the state does give our small schools uh, some money based on taxes. Uh, and I've been asked by several different school districts what's going to happen now if we don't get the $100,000 from the state that we normally get because of taxes. Is the Cherokee Nation going to pitch in? I mean, that, because a lot of them rely on that. So there's just a lot of things that this brings to the table that I don't, uh, that we're just going to see. And I think that's one of them. So, <coughs> just food for thought. Does anybody else have anything for Trey? Good report. Okay, <coughs> Trey, I would like for you to stick around. I have some questions on the operating budget. So if you could just hang out with us until we get there. I'd appreciate it. Okay. okay, thank you. Yep. Okay, I know Diane's on there, so let's go ahead and see what uh, what you have for us today. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll try to be pretty brief. You have my report in front of you, and uh, you uh, see where our Restore program, which is the disaster relief grant that we got back in July from the Department of Labor. That's being operated by Ashana Miles and her staff, the LP Grant Group. And uh, she was turning cartwheels yesterday because she'd already met half of her uh, <laughs> employment standards for this year. And uh, they have 400 clients that they have to put on the program, and she's already put 200 on. Oh, wow. So she was really ecstatic yesterday. And the other new grant is operated by Josh Drywater. It is the Trade and Economic uh, Employment Recovery Program, his uh, pet program. They're going to operate that. The reason that we combine those programs because when we get the grants, they're usually two to three year grants. And we're already in the last leg of some of these other grants. So that way we don't have to lay staff off and the staff can transition over because everybody's cross trained in our department. Uh, we put pictures in the report. Uh, that was something that I think you, Madam Chair, uh, had asked us to do at some point in time. And uh, we kind of highlighted some of our uh, participants. Uh, Matt Lamont, the reentry grant information is there. Uh, we had around $4,385,580 for reentry. Uh, you were asking about that last month, so I put that in there. Uh, the um, Past month was Manufacturing Month and uh, Chief Hopkins, Chief Warner, uh, they passed a proclamation declaring it a Manufacturing Day in uh, the Cherokee Nation. And we spotlighted uh, some of our programs in this month's report. Uh, the Milo's Tea Company there in Tulsa, uh, the, uh, I can't remember what other programs we have in here. Uh, the new Sausadale uh, paper company here in Inola, if you'll recall that, we worked on that project for probably about four years. Uh, it's actually sitting on the edge of the Creek Nation, but in order to get there, you have to come into the Cherokee Nation. So it's actually more in our area, and uh, we've been helping with recruitment. You see some of the pictures where we did the proclamation. And then um, about two weeks ago, Scott Fry with Mid-America Industrial Park, him and uh, Sherry Alexander 
had said the next time that we were in prior, he wanted to come by and do a presentation. We thought he was going to talk to our group, so we had the prior office there to listen to him, and that gave us an award for innovation. Oh, wow. And uh, that's what you see in the report, and uh, we were real pleased. Uh, he said that he was aware that we were working on a friendship, and uh, we spotlighted one of our uh, graduates at the Pelco company. Uh, who actually went through and got his apprenticeship certification. So we have been real busy. Uh, Matt Lamont, uh, Josh Drywater, and uh, Hunter Palmer. And sometimes they bring George Roach in with us. Uh, those guys are all out there trying to do economic development. And uh, in our reports, you'll see that. Uh, we. Uh, took on the Vocational Rehabilitation Disability, and John Crittenden and the TANA group worked on that. And uh, John said there was about 4,300 and something applications that they uh, had for this, which was within our jurisdictional boundary. And uh, on TARO, uh, we normally would have had our TARO banquet the third or fourth of the third of November. Uh, we're working on a video uh, we are going to recognize those Indian businesses. Uh, we solicited uh, from all of the uh, CARO businesses to nominate. Uh, we have awards that are going to be presented, or they may have already been presented, and we just got pictures of them. But we will make sure that everybody gets a copy of that video on our CARO banquet, because we don't want to be remiss and not uh, presenting those awards. Uh, why not? It's just presenting an environmental award, and uh, Matt Lamont is presenting a reentry award. So all this will be on this video. We'll probably have it for you at the December meeting, if not before. Do y'all have any questions? Anybody have uh, go, Kanan? Uh, Diane, this is probably more appropriate for yesterday's meeting, but I got you here in front of me, so I'll ask you. Um, do did we start a program for uh, <coughs> job training for fiber optics line? Uh, Lane. Yes, we did. I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, we have been uh, in class about not quite two weeks, and uh, we uh, had uh, purchased a digger truck, and the digger truck went out yesterday. It was the first time it was in use, and uh, Hunter got pictures of it. They were out there digging, and uh, we we're getting an old command center. <clears throat> That treasurer Scott was so gracious to help us get that was sitting over there in the it wasn't being used and it's been sitting for several years and we're using that to store our, our uh, fiber in. So yes, we did start one and uh, part of the training is the CDL. Part of the training is the climbing the poles. So we're doing that along with the lineman program and our CDL truck driving. So, we just got a lot of things going on out on the other end of town, and uh, I can't say enough about the staff. They're working very hard to keep that pro those problems going, and we will start our third lineman class in January, and we'll have a graduation in January from the first class. So, well, that, uh, yes, we can have a fiber program. Well, good. That That's good, um, especially in our neck of the woods over there. They're just now getting to where they're putting in good wireless internet. And uh, the problem is they only have one crew in the area that's uh, able to, to lay that fiber because there's not enough folks that can do it. Um, do Are you guys looking for instructors or anything like that? You got instructors? Yeah, our, our instructor is through Oklahoma State Tech out of Altmogee. And uh, he is uh, certified to teach both the classes. We have the lineman program going on two days a week, and then we have the other program going on two days a week, and then we have the CDL going on in between there for the ones that have to get the CDL. And uh, Hunter wanted me to mention that two of the students from the first class have been hired and are making starting out $25 an hour. And then they'll go up as they've been there for so many more weeks. So these are good paying jobs and they're going to be in high demand and that was one of the reasons why we got into this and uh, Chief Hoskin was very instrumental in helping us to pave the way to get these things done and I can't say enough because he knew what the job market was going to be here in this area and uh, I know that uh, all of those guys are going to have good paying jobs and when there is a disaster, a hurricane, tornado, whatever in the area, 
uh, there are crews that go out and they get paid really good money during that time period. And that's where some of our guys are going and doing their practical for this class. Thank you, Diane. You're welcome. Okay. Anything else? Okay, Diane, we'll move on. As always, we appreciate you. Well, thank you. I'll hang around until after the tariff certification. Okay, sounds good. Madam Chair, how is Diane able to come in so clear? And the others can't seem to make time. She's right here, no? You're right next door. Yeah, she's right there. Well, well, well I, we have I, offices. And I will here. just say, whatever them. task is before her, Diane figures out a way. To <laughs> 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 I, mean. I made my point. Yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> they need to go see Diane. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Anna's here. Tell us that good. Yeah, hopefully I come in that clear um, as well. So, you, you know, I have to compete with Diane all the time. But all it's the a time. Tough job. Um, I wanted to just, you have a copy of my report, and um, I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. I did just want to point out on page two of the report, I just wanted to um, kind of go over the fact that um, since 2010, um, <clears throat> we funded 337 businesses, uh, creating over 1,500 jobs, and also um, helping um, entrepreneurs put an additional $17 million in economic investment in Northeast Oklahoma through the Small Business um, Loan Program. I don't know if you um, realize that the um, company there's a, a tribal corporation that owns the loan programs, and it's called the Cherokee Nation Economic Development mm -hmm. Trust Authority. And we are actually one of the largest um, loan programs that are community development financial institutions in Indian country. With um, And our program is now, um, uh, uh, the trust authority has about 15 million, is about a $15 million um, program, which is, is, is very large for a community loan program. So I just wanted to point those two things out in the report. And other than that, I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Go ahead, Kane. Anna, hey, I just wanted to, uh, you know, publicly say thank you again. You, you guys have been really awesome um, working with several, several of my constituents the past few months and helping them um, and I was actually talking to somebody the other day about how um, you know as tribal counselors I think sometimes maybe we, we forget about about you being there or at least I'm guilty of that because we work so much with human services and housing um, that we forget there's this other option over there and um, it's really important because minorities alike um, sometimes home ownership is a bit of a pipe dream I, I remember that um, and so you guys have, have really impacted the community in, in showing uh, young Cherokees that they can own homes and helping them achieve that. So um, it's just kind of kind of just been pointed out uh, to me. Oh, well, I've just recently kind of seen the importance of that, and, and that, that's my apologies, but you guys are great. Just wanted to say that. Thank you. I'll, I'll pass that along. The staff works very hard, and they do a really great job in trying to uh, – provide the best customer service experience that we can for all of our clients in math or in the small business programs. Well, and I would just say, this was on um, yesterday's report, but the, and so I don't have the actual numbers in front of me, but the VITA program, with the constraints that you had and the disruptions in that, I think you served like four fewer clients than last year, which is, just amazing that your staff was able to find alternate ways to help those people get their taxes filed. And so um, please give them my, you know, um, congratulations or praise or whatever, because that's a very important service. That's a daunting task for a lot of people. And you had to pivot and find a new way to do it. And I really appreciate that. <coughs> Right. I will pass that along, and you may not know that the majority of our VITA clients are elderly. Those yes. are who we help them out. And so it, it was a little bit of a challenge. Staff did a great job in um, in reaching out to people, and that doesn't even count the number of people that we helped with uh, receive their economic stimulus checks. So. Right. Yep. 
They, they need a voice. Okay, anybody else? <clears throat> and I just want to tell you, I, I, I do know your number, you know, and you'll learn that number. Mm -hmm. 120 uh, businesses that you've helped here in the past few years, just in Cherokee County. And, and you know, when you talk about over 600 jobs, you know, that goes a long ways in our little area here. And, you know, the Cherokee people really feel and appreciate that. I know I know, I do. And the money that's brought in through that, your startup. So, yeah, that home ownership, uh, Councillor Duncan, that, that's a big deal. And, uh, and we have this resource here that, that's sometimes overlooked. And you guys do an outstanding job, you and your staff. And we appreciate you. So uh, thank, thank you, you and much. stay safe. Anybody else? Okay, and I would appreciate your report. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> All right. Okay, tarot certifications. You got a new list uh, handed out just today. I read it all. I made four people. I have a motion and a second to approve the tarot. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposition? Okay, you also got a community assistant. Have you checked yours, Councilor Vasquez? Yes, I have. Is right it all good? Second. I don't care about the rest of it. Okay, uh, let's make sure. I think Councilor Austin might have something to add. Yes, I do. I do. <laughs> Christ United Methodist Church in Claremore for Christmas Benevolence and Emmanuel Baptist Church in Claremore for uh, Christmas Benevolence. How much on those? 1000 each. <coughs> Just a second. There. Everybody else good? Okay. Sure. Councilor Buzzard? Yeah. I'm going, I need to add mine for $500. Okay, reference program. Jay Rick. Oh, okay. Place it rescue. Place it rescue. Jody, I want to do 1000 on the Buy and Peace Center. Okay, is everybody else good? Yeah, move for approval. Second. Uh, all those in favor of approving community assistance? Aye. 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 Any opposition to that? Okay, law enforcement. I don't know that there's anything new there. Jody, do you know off the top of your head? Uh, there's, there's nothing new. I mean, okay. there, nothing new. Uh, I want to mention too. Uh, I'd had a question earlier that. Of course, the, uh, the law enforcement money is a uh, motor vehicle tax, so it'll be uh, usually around January before we get the, the new money in. Okay. Because it's uh, based on the 2020 calculation that's not finalized yet, so. Okay. Okay, did everybody take a look at their roads projects? I do have uh, one to add on the roads program for uh, Councilman Shambaugh, 57th Street overlay in Kansas for 21,000. That'll be out of his motor fuel tax money. 57th Street in Kansas? Yeah, we have like 150 streets. Good year. Oh, oh motion for approval. We need some help. I got a motion. Give a second. second. Okay. Motion and a second on the roads. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposition? I think there were a couple of new sports teams if I am. Legislative Act 17 20 authorizing the comprehensive operating budget for fiscal year 2021, Mod 2, and declaring emergency. Put that in the form of a motion. Second. second. A motion and second. Okay, Trey, I did have a couple of um, questions on this. A lot of this looks like it's CARES Act funding, with the exception of the Feral Swine Project. Um, it was, are those separate grants? from the total CARES Act funding we received from Treasury, were they all applied for separately within those departments? Can you just tell me a little bit about each of the, I mean, not a, a long thing, uh, about each of those grants. How did we come to get those? 
Yeah, so they are separate uh, from the coronavirus. I, I, I think what you're referring to is the coronavirus relief fund, which is the money, the, the 411 million that we got from Treasury. Yes. So these are separate from that. And they just, um, some of them we applied for, some of them were actually allocations uh, per the statute itself. And um, I think specifically the welfare assistance was um, an allocation. Uh, I believe that was 3.4 million or so, but they are separate. And um, sometimes, you know, I, I, I'm giving you a non-answer and I realize that, but yes, the departments may have applied for those separately um, with help of our grants department. And then some of them are just a formula that was um, in the statute and it was an allocation to the tribes, you know, in the same manner that we typically receive our annual allocations from, from the, from the larger funding source of, uh, from like DOI or, or whichever uh, department it came from. Okay, so what you're saying is if they were already on some type of federal program based on their allocation, a percentage of CARES money was set aside to beef up those programs already receiving uh, money from that budget federally? Yes. Okay. Yeah. That's what In many about. cases, that that is the case. Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, That's the only question I have. There are a couple where they. I, I will say there are a couple of the programs where there was an initial allocation, just in the manner that you described, and then and what the department had decided to do was they. Um, so for instance, they they put in you know 100 million dollars in the CARES Act, and they took 50 million of it and distributed it based on that allocation, um, and then they the they had a hold back that tribes could then apply for. So if they had a greater need, then, then they had a little more discretion to uh, distribute the remainder of those funds. Um, so it, it could have been a combination of both okay. too as well. Okay, that's all. Thank you. Okay, are there any other yes. questions on this operating budget? Go speak. Not operating budget. Have we voted on it yet? No. Not Let's yet. vote on Can it we? and I'll make comments. Okay, all those in favor of passing the operating budget, aye. 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 Any opposition? Okay, that passes. Okay, go speak. No, I just want to make a comment, Trey. The, the uh, Cherokee Nation employees uh, and our CNB employees, under the, the severe circumstances that, that we're still trying to overcome, we were still able, with, with the cooperation and, and the business mind of our board, our CEO, you, we were able to give bonuses to the employees. We did not miss a beat here at Cherokee Nation or the CNB employees. And I want to commend the council members and the, the people that, that oversee because we are guardians of our finances. And so far, not operating at full capacity at our businesses, we were still able to provide the bonuses for our employees. So, council members, you know, you guys have done a good job in the, under circumstance. So, Trey, I want to let you and your staff know that we appreciate all that you do and keeping us in financial stability, okay? Well done. Thank you. Okay, um, I think that's all we have for this meeting. I would entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. You adjourn. Okay. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposition? We are adjourned.